Hello, I'm Dr. Bill Tulo from Princeton, New Jersey, and I'm with my colleagues, Dr. Andy Morgenstern, Dr. Clark Chang, and Dr. Barry Iden. Our first question is a very simple and basic question. And what is keratoconus? Andy, why don't you start off and tell us a little bit about keratoconus? So keratoconus is a bilateral progressive uh, asymmetric condition of the cornea. Uh, it happens all throughout lifetime, but most frequently it takes place in the second to fourth decade of life. That's when we see it the most. Uh, it can range in severity from, from mild uh, to severe, and uh, in some severe cases, we can even be having patients with uh, real low vision problems. This could be a pretty significant condition. Um, the mechanism of action of this disease, Bill, um, uh, when I've researched and when I've seen with my patients, you know, this is a disease of the entire cornea. We know the eye is like uh, essentially like a water balloon, and it has some forces on the inside that push outward. Well, in a case of keratoconus, the, uh, the cornea, the structural integrity of the cornea is weak. And even though that pressure inside the eye may be normal, it's still a force that's pushing on the cornea. That causes the cornea to bulge forward, to increase in steepening, and to thin out. And that's where we get the problem with keratoconus. Uh, with research coming out, and we realize that most likely, and I think there's quite a preponderance of evidence that we are dealing with a hereditary condition. I think it's really important to understand that because that really influences how we manage not only the patient, but everybody related to that patient as well. Uh, we're dealing with a condition that probably is associated with abnormal collagen in the cornea, affecting the biomechanics of the cornea. So this then influences diagnostic testing, again, for early detection. That's the key element. And what is the traditional methods that we've used to diagnose keratoconus? Over the years, what, what tools have we used? Corneal mapping devices that map the curvature, not the elevation, the curvature of the front surface of the cornea. We've also used slip lamps. We're looking for uh, different things uh, uh, in the cornea, like uh, Vostria uh, and other uh, clinical signs that we pick up. This is an ongoing issue and an on ongoing problem for all of us because those of us who are involved in the management of this disease at a higher level shall we say, seeing many more patients than perhaps the average. We're using technologies that are far more advanced, which we'll get into specifics in just a few moments. But the rank and file and vast majority of eye care practitioners are still depending upon methodologies of diagnosis that virtually will detect keratoconus when it's already become very clinically significant. And because now we're looking at halting progression, prevention, saving vision, um, perhaps we have to rethink what routine standard of care is all about and apply some of the newer technologies. So if there are new technologies out there to help us diagnose this disease earlier, what are these new technologies that you're using in your practices? Barry, why don't we start with you? So let's just start with the analysis of the shape of the cornea, okay? And it was a, a major leap forward when people started to do placido topography versus keratometry in the detection of keratoconus. And I think that would automatically change those prevalence rates if using that definition based upon placido topography. But we know, unfortunately, that there are significant limitations to placido topography that we really have to acknowledge and address. Number one, placido topography does not measure corneal thickness in any way. And we know that corneal thickness is a really critical element, not specifically how thin the thinnest point is, but where the location of that thinnest point is in terms of relative position in the cornea and the change in thickness from the thinnest point out to the periphery. Very, very important. Secondly, uh, placido topography doesn't measure the back of the cornea. And all of us who have worked with instruments that measure the back of the cornea realize that this disease not only probably starts there in terms of elevation changes, but surely is more advanced there and progresses greater there as well. And we know from the global consensus paper that came out last year that the definition of keratoconus is changes on the back of the cornea. So um, consistent with the definition. And so one of the criteria. Yeah. One of the three uh, so it's a, right. It's, so it's important right. to point out that the uh, so the the global's con uh, the global consensus paper that was published in March 2015 does indicate that in order for uh, confirm a diagnosis, pr there must be presence of two of three two of the three criteria that mm -hmm. they uh, have stipulated, and that is deepening of 
of the interior surface um, that we are all very comfortable with, mm -hmm. uh, steepening of the um, posterior surface, uh, and which currently we're, so we're going to talk about technology I'm that does you that. On that one, Clark. Uh, and let me finish the number okay, three, sure. Ahead. Always challenge welcomed. Yeah, uh, but number three, also it just going back to what Barry had said, the spatial relationship, and that is the rate of pachymetry changes from the point of thinning out to periphery. So that that's important because we need instrument that can both triangulate front surface and back surface at every single point across a certain length or core diameter uh, to understand what the uh, what the spatial relationship is and from there you can extract the value of pachymetry with corneal thickness at every at different point and that is very important and that's why central corneal thickness as one single data point is not is actually regarded as one of the least reliable parameter to diagnose keratoconus what are the clinical benefits to a patient for this early diagnosis well very simple. We now can stop progression. Mm -hmm. Simple statement, powerful statement, right? We have technology now that can influence the natural course of this disease and stop it fairly well in its tracks with the advent of corneal crosslinking. When you can influence a disease uh, progression like that, um, earliest diagnosis makes all the sense in the world. So let's think it through. When would we want to make this early diagnosis along the continuum of the disease? In my view, preclinical. What I mean by preclinical, it's not affecting visual performance. We're not seeing anything clinically under the slit lamp, but we know the disease is there and we have a high suspicion or confirmation, depending upon how we've been monitoring the patient, that that disease will or is progressive. We institute this therapy. We stop the disease from progressing, we preserve vision. How do you fit the Penicam into your routine eye exam? We're fortunate enough to have quite a bit of advanced technology, including Oculus Penicam. And now what we're doing for children eight or above, and we may actually bring that number even down because keep in mind these technologies are harmless to the patient, uh, are rather quick and easy to do, and as long as a child can sit for it, quite easy to perform. Um, but at this point, eight and above, all the way in through their 20s, we're getting a baseline Oculus Penicam reading, and then periodically, and we're not quite so sure at what interval would be most appropriate without the development of symptoms or other kinds of risk factors, periodically we'll repeat them. Now, we utilize Penicam actually on all of our contact lens patients to see things happening to the cornea potentially. So if these uh, individuals are wearing contacts, they're getting one every year anyway. But I'm talking about a non-contact lens wearing individual. We'll do a baseline and we're still working on how frequently we should want to repeat those tests. Tell us why our, our, our profession should be looking at cross-linking for our patients. So the efficacy of just looking at arresting the disease or slowing down the keratoconus disease is anywhere from uh, 92 to about 98 percent, pending which paper that you read. So Barry, if we have a, a treatment modality like cross-linking that has an efficacy in the 90 plus percentile range, we have a diagnostic machine. There are many machines out there that can measure the cornea front and back, but I think one of the unique things I'd like you to talk about is the uh, validated database that the Pentacam has and what the advantage of that is. To me, that's one of the key elements of this instrument that make it so powerful. It's wonderful in its technology, the ability to measure elevation on the front and back and give us a global thickness reading uh, off the cornea. But what makes the Oculus Pentacam stand out in my mind across the board compared to a lot of other instruments is the statistical analysis software that's available. And that has been developed to a very high degree. We uh, referred before to some of the key elements, looking at things like posterior elevation, reference sphere-based, anterior elevation, global pachymetry, pachymetric progression. All of these things are statistically analyzed within the software of the system. And there actually is a package, the Bell and Ambrosio uh, Ectasia uh, package, which does a tremendous job in assessing the statistical likelihood of a cornea being ectatic or keratoconic. This is amazingly powerful stuff. And now we're even starting to identify some of the parameters that can be obtained from the instrument that would be most sensitive in picking up progression. Because this is critical in deciding not only who will get cross-linking, but in deciding about the efficacy of the treatment over time. Excellent. Um, Clark, when you use the Penicam, what do you find most useful to you in the clinical setting? 
I love the fact that it's so comfortable and so quick. Patient finds it, find it very easy to sit through an exam. And that, I can't tell you how important it is for serial testing for patient monitoring in the future. So one final point I'd like to follow up on that Barry brought up earlier was um, monitoring the progression of the disease. Um, there's some new software in the Pentacam that Dr. Bellin devised for following uh, corneal progression. I think it's particularly important when you want to measure the effect of cross-linking to see if someone is truly stabilized. Barry, can you tell us a little bit about this sure. brand new software? Sure. Over this past year, um, you're right, a couple of new uh, factors have been looked at. First, in terms of staging keratoconus, getting a better idea of that, but I think more powerfully in terms of progression. One of the values is called the ARC, which relates to the curvature on the anterior surface of the cornea in an area between three and four millimeters around the thin point, but it is a curvature value. Then the PRC, or the posterior, has the same concept on the back of the cornea. We're starting to look at those numbers and document those numbers in all of our cases of keratoconus and suspected keratoconus and utilizing those numbers to watch over time. Now what needs to be developed is a much stronger normative database for change over time. There's some, you know, early statistical analysis based on very small populations if you look at what, uh, what has been done so far, but I'm sure in the very uh, relatively near future those numbers in the studies will expand to larger uh, databases. So we can really get some strong numbers and say, for example, in the ARC or PRC, how much of a change over time is test-retest variability versus true progression of the disease. Same thing for uh, pachymetry. Um, we need to know what amount of change is significant to say we truly have progression. The answer is not 100% solid yet, but we are getting much closer than we were before. The nice thing about that new classification system, it also takes into account uh, uncorrected vision. Yes. Um, so when patients lose their best corrected vision, they, that can be taken into account in the ABCD classification. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great start and it's the, really the first system I've seen to watch patients affect from cross-linking the benefits they have and the stability of their cornea over time. <laughs>